Okay, welcome back to Gold's Garage. We are back on Blakely's 340 Mopar engine. Finally, we finally got the bearings. We talked about that lots. And so I got a follow up. Uh, in the previous video, I mentioned how I was going to mix and match 009 bearings with 010 bearings, 9 thou undersize and 10 thou undersize to get the clearances right on the money. And that didn't quite work out the way I planned it. So I'm going to show you how we solved that. And since we're in the progress, I'm going to show you some methods that I use. I don't know if they're tips or not for you, but methods that I use when assembling an engine, mainly to help stay organized so you don't you know, get mixed up and make mistakes. Uh, we are, these pistons and rods are, designed for floating pins, so they need spiral locks to install. They're a little bit tricky if you've never done them uh, to install. And at the end of this, and in a second clip, we're gonna stop, or we're gonna actually install. I saved one piston install, uh, installing the spiral locks, and kind of catch up on what we're doing with, with Blakely's rebuild. So, so in the last, in the previous video, uh, called the blueprinting searching for perfection or striving for perfection. So we wanted to get bearing clearances on Blakely's 340 on the connecting rod bearings between two thousandths and two and a half thousandths of clearance. And when we first disassembled this engine, the crankshaft was in good condition. It was, wasn't out of shape, it wasn't scratched, it wasn't worn, it was, it was round but it grew from number one journal, actually number one journal was the biggest, so it got smaller by number eight journal, uh, and by almost a thousandth of an inch. So that created a problem with bearing clearances. So the crankshaft's been turned 10 thou. So uh, the problem was, and I showed it, and I will put a screenshot up of this, exactly what you see here, in the video so you can follow along with what I'm doing. You can't see it in the camera, but you will see it in the screenshot. So at the end of the last video, I got this far and I calculated I didn't have the bearings yet. I ordered uh, connector rod bearings that were 0 0.009 thou undersized. So if the crank's 10 thou undersized and the bearings are 9 thou undersized, that should give me one more thousandth of an inch clearance. But based on what I started with, what I predicted was on cylinders five, six, seven, and eight, I was going to have too much clearance, more than, not excessively, would have ran, would have been okay, but more than two and a half thousand. So what I predicted was I would mix and match uh, 009 bearing and with the 010 bearings. I already have the 010 bearings. That's what we started with. So, and that was the plan. And I explained why you can do that. It's safe to do that up to a thousandths or half a thousandths per side. You can mix and match. And if you want to see a full detailed explanation, look at the previous video uh, called Blueprinting, Searching for Perfection or whatever. So uh, explain why that it's okay to do that. So that was the plan. But so I got the 009 bearings and started installing them here last night and didn't turn out quite the way I expected. Not far off, but enough that we, if we want to stay in that two to two and a half thou, I had to do something else. So what I predicted was that I would have, uh, I actually would have a 0019 on cylinder number two, which was almost there. And then by the end, 0024. And then the, and the five, six, seven, and eight, I would mix and match uh, I wouldn't use both halves of the 009, I would use half of the other bearing as well. So sometimes things don't work out the way you plan. Wasn't far off, but in the next column, as when I first in, uh, put it together the way I described, what I had was I still didn't have enough clearance on number one and two cylinders. I still had. Um, about 0 0.015 thou and a half. Now, would the engine run with that? Yes, it would run fine. But I wanted to get two to two and a half thou. So, uh, and that's with using both 
uh, undersized bearing, both 009 bearings together, I still wasn't getting um, 002 thaw. So at the same time, at the other end of the crank where uh, the, the journals are a little bit smaller, uh, I had more clearance than I needed. So what to do? Because I've already uh, uh, used all, all my idea of in using the uh, 009 bearings on both sides. I still didn't get it. So I started measuring and what I ended up doing was swapping connecting rods. I swapped number one with number seven and number two with number eight connecting rod. And even though it's the same size bearing, just because of the way things work out, tolerances plus or minus a tenth of a thou, we're only talking small, small numbers here. So just for relativity, a human hair is four thousandths of an inch. So we're talking a tenth of a thou, not very much. But there's a little bit of variation. So to use that to my advantage, took a lot of measuring, okay, trial and error. I ended up swapping a number one and seven uh, rods, connecting rods, and number two and eight connecting rods. And that gave me 0020, 22, 20, 20, 24, 20, 24, 22, for an average of 002.2 thou. And I target originally was 2.3 thou. So I'm pretty happy I got that. Now, uh, somebody might take this engine apart, hopefully a long time from now, it should run for a long time. And say, man, this guy, you know, he mixed up the connecting rods. What was he thinking? Well, normally when you put an engine back together, connecting rods are stamped, they're marked, and you normally, yes, you always put them back in the place you took them out of. But when you're changing the bearings and shaking the pistons and you're boring the cylinders, the rods don't really care where they go. And as long as you measure and you are confident that your measurements are good, then there's nothing wrong with doing that. I should write a little note to somebody in the oil pan if they ever take it apart so they understand that. But uh, other than that, it worked out great. And I've swapped the rods already. And we're in the process. I've got, uh, by Alec just stopped by, I got two pistons in, in the engine. I'm making progress. So hope that makes uh, sense. In the end, we got the result we wanted. No harm done, no harm, no foul. And I ended up using, by the way, because of the situation, all the bearings are 009 now. There's no mix and match because I actually needed all the clearance I could get in number one and two cylinders. So I used uh, uh, 009 on both ends. So every bearing, there's no mix and match, although that would have been okay. But there is no mix and match and they're all 009 bearings. So something else, when you open the bearing box, I mentioned in the last video, I always look at the number on the box and look at the number on the back of the bearing. And in the case of these bearings, because they're narrow bearings to make up for, if it was an aftermarket crankshaft, extra radius, there is an upper and a lower. And the idea of that is if you turn the bearing around the other way, the radius, the narrow side would be on the wrong side. Well, one of the boxes had two lowers in it. so. What happens there? I was able to use it because this crank doesn't need the extra clearance, so it really doesn't matter. The bearings aren't different in the material or anything. The difference is uh, the width of them, and it makes no difference whatsoever. The difference is about 40 thousandths of an inch in width, so that width is on the other side. We have lots of clearance in the radius of this crankshaft, not an issue, but if you measure stuff and you check stuff and you find out that sort of thing, what do you do about it, right? So, so while we're assembling, I'm gonna point out a couple things here. Uh, mainly things I do to stay organized. One of the things is when you buy your, your pistons and your rings, it'll come with some instructions and it shows you the orientation of where everything goes, what rings go, so that's the front of the engine. So the top compression ring goes on this side, the second compression ring goes there, the expander rail goes here, and the two other uh, uh, oil rails go here and here. So I usually mark out a piston in advance and put all those numbers on it, do them all together, always try to 
when you're assembling an engine, if you're doing an operation, do all of them at the same time. Then you don't look for your tools and your parts. You got to do them at the same time. Stay organized that way. And you use the advantage of sort of repeatability. So the other thing is, uh, when I start off, the rings that are going to be uh, in the engine are already there. I've already gapped them. I already checked the gaps. And in the case of these rings, uh, they're file fit rings. They aren't file fit rings, sorry. But because these are um, hyperutectic pistons, the manufacturer recommends extra clearance. So I actually did that by hand. I actually, I only had to take a couple thousandths and I did that with a hand file. So the top compression ring has got about 25 or 26 thousandths of end gap. The second one's got the standard end gap, 18 thousandths or so, and I didn't have to do anything with it. So when I do that, I put them in the cylinder in the, in the order that they belong. So when I start installing them on the piston, pull them out of that cylinder, put them on that piston, and you stay organized. So the other thing is, so all the top and second compression rings, for what it's worth too, on just a little thing to remember, usually with uh, plasma molly rings, the top ring is usually square, the top compression ring. The second ring is like a plow ring. Its a job is it's um, as much of an oil ring as it is a compression ring. And it's got a, a chamfer on the bottom to help plow that oil back out into the cylinder. It's an oil ring as well. So it has it is marked top and bottom. So always pay attention to that. Top doesn't mean it's the top ring. It means the top it's the top of the second ring. Okay. So the other thing is when I start, uh, all the other rings are already in. I lay them out. So I'm down. I've already put the two pistons in. So I'm down to four sets of rings. And so you keep track of everything as you're going. In the case of this engine, I don't have, I don't have a custom uh, ring compressor for it. Uh, I use this universal one. This guy works pretty good. Actually, I've used it on lots of different sizes. This is 4.115 bore. So uh, that's the wrong. But it's an odd shaped bore, so I got to think about 4.080. Sorry, 4.080. I'm getting the numbers mixed up. 4.080 bore. So it's uh, I have half a dozen of the uh, standard ones, but this is a universal one. It works pretty good. Uh, so we're going to stop there um, and I'll throw in the tip of the day while we're here before I forget. Alec keeps reminding me of this one. It's not a big deal, but uh, bolts, and now I've made whole videos about fasteners. So if you look at the radio marks on the head of a bolt, what do they mean? If it's got three radio lines, it's a grade five bolt. And if it's got five or six radio lines, it's a grade eight bolt. So there's are two examples. And usually grade eight bolts are, are uh, plated, as you can see, with a nicer finish. So you don't feel so bad about spending so much on them because they are expensive. So a grade two bolt, if you, I don't have one here because I don't use them, has no radial lines. So we call that garden variety. So a grade two bolt is somewhere around 80 to 100,000 PSI tensile. Uh, a, grade, uh, a grade five bolt is about 120,000 and a grade eight bolt is about 150,000 PSI tensile. So, and when you're using a grade eight bolt, you should always use a grade eight nut and particularly a grade eight washer. If you're torquing anything and you use a standard stamp steel washer, the purpose of torquing is to stretch the bolt. If the washer's not hard enough, instead of stretching the bolt, you'll squash the washer and you won't put any uh, stress into your bolt and you won't have a good stiff uh, joint. So that's just a little uh, sidebar for you. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, assembly lube that I use, Permatex. There's all kinds of it. They all work pretty good. It's just nice sticky stuff. One of the things I'll come and have Alex show you in here is I coated this cam with the original CompCam spray and lube probably a month ago when I put this cam in because we've been waiting on bearings for a long time. And it's still on there pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I'll actually put another coat of it on before I put the lifters in. 
And with a with a Mopar, it's, it's nice and open, so you can get at it and do that. With a Chevrolet, it's not easy to do that. Got the pressure gauge set up, so we are going to prime this engine. We will show that. So please like and subscribe while we got you here. And we're going to shut down now, and we're going to try and put another clip of installing spiral locks. Okay, in this clip, uh, we're going to try and show you uh, installing spiral locks into a piston. And one of the things you want to make sure you do is you get, this is a floating pin piston, so you want to make sure you get the pin in the right place and the rod in the right place. So yeah, it's a number four cylinder, so in coming around here, this is number four cylinder. So uh, if you orientate it that way, <clears throat> number four cylinder is at the back of the crankshaft, so you want the radius to be at the back, right? And of course, you always want the sides of your, uh, there's, there's numbers on there, those numbers to line up, of course, the, rod, the, the cap obviously lines up with that. But the key point is, you have to make sure if you're putting the rod on the piston, uh, that when the valve reliefs are always at the top, and the radius is at the back. So, um, by the way, when I, before, last thing I do before I oil the cylinders, the rings are in the bores, they come out, go on the pistons. As I clean the bore with Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, did Fantastic doesn't pay me anything to say this, but I've used this for a long time. It's a great uh, final cleaner and, and grease cutter. And that gives me a really clean cylinder. Then I oil the cylinder, of course. We put lots of oil on the piston and on the cylinder before finally going in. So let's see if we can get a spiral locks in here for you. So these are a little bit uh, tricky to do. And one of the disadvantages, these original, uh, when I took these, this engine apart, it had circlips. Circlips are a lot easier if you have circlip pliers. They're a lot easier to put in. These are a little frustrating sometimes, but there's a little groove in there. I've already put the one in the other side, so it's already covered. And that makes this one a little easier because I got a backstop uh, to get the second one in. So one of the first things you have to do, and this may look like it's not a good thing to do, but it is, you have to stretch it out. It'll, there's no way it's going to go in there if you don't stretch it out like this because when you stretch it out the diameter gets smaller and if you don't stretch it out the diameter is too big for it to go in so that's probably and once it's in place it all goes together and it's it cannot get out of there anyway so it's a little bit tricky you want to try and get it started get the tip of it I'm gonna put a little bit of a twist in the tip to get it started there we go and see how I can do here now. This is the tool that I use. You might not get it on the first try. <laughs> it's a tricky job. And work our way around. Once you get that first bit in there, work our way around. And once again, the fact that I pulled it out makes the diameter smaller, and that's what makes it possible for it to go in. It will not go in there in the original diameter. It's impossible for it to do that. And we are coming around here. Guys use different kinds of tools. You can use a flat screwdriver to do this. This is a tool I tried this time. I actually had all the rest of them in before and I kind of saved one for the video so I put the rest of them in some time ago and there you go we are in there it's in that groove and once it's in it'll expand and it will not come out of there and you are safe to go so uh, I think I mentioned everything I could for this time we'll be back with you with more details of Blakely's 340 build as we make progress. Thanks for watching Gold Garage. Please like and subscribe.